hey. Good morning, church. We up, we awake. As we find our seats, um, we're just going to kick this thing off with a song. Um, like I said before, uh, I'd love for you to stand with us, um, but if you need to sit or, or uh, do your thing, just worship however you need to. Father, I love you. We give this time to you um, as we demonstrate our submission to you, Lord, we lift up these songs. We give you praise. I pray that your spirit just fills this place, Lord. I pray that uh, the life-changing power of just who you are and of your name um, just is so thick. I pray that you speak your words to us today in a way that we can apply it to our lives. Or reveal yourself um, where we're confused or have questions, Lord. Above all, I pray that your will be done. And I pray that you just align our hearts to that very thing. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hi everyone, my name is Jackie and I would like to welcome you here to More to Life. If this is your first time with us, we are thrilled that you are here. You should notice a green welcome card on your table. Do us a favor and fill one of those out so that we know how to pray for you. And for the rest of my More to Life family, here's what's happening right now at More to Life. Hey everybody, we just wanted to take a second to be sure and invite everyone, fourth through sixth grade, to Friday Night Fuse. So Fuse is something really exciting. It's where M2L Kids and M2L Ministries comes together so that way when your student leaves M2L Kids and they enter the youth group, they are acquainted, they know where the youth group is, they know us, uh, they know the other students, so it makes it an easier transition. So Friday Night Fuse happens every Friday night in July, and if your student is interested in attending, we would love to have them. We just get together, we eat, we play games, build relationships, and study the Word. All you need to do is go to FridayNightFuse.com and sign them up there. It's going to be really exciting, so we are excited to get to know your student, and uh, so we'll see you Friday. Hey, More Life family, quick reminder. August 1st, uh, Secure Gift will be gone away. We will be completely switched over to Subsplash Giving. So if you need any help in signing up for Subsplash Giving, you can find a green uh, card at the Welcome Center that lays out step-by-step -step how to do it. And also, if you have reoccurring giving with Secure Gift, make sure you cancel it when you sign up for Subsplash Giving. Again, we have until July 31st is when um, Secure Gift will be done away with. August 1st will be Subsplash. So if you have any questions on how to sign up about Subsplash, please uh, contact me directly. I would love to help you. And thank you so much for partnering with us through giving. Hey church family, in just a few moments there will be an opportunity to worship the Lord by giving back to the Lord. Because of your obedience with your tithes and offerings and the Lord's faithfulness, More to Life is able to see lives transformed by Jesus Christ. There are four easy ways you can worship by giving. On your table we have baskets where you can put your tithes and offerings in one of our giving envelopes. And, and in just a few moments we'll be passing those baskets, but don't worry, if you miss one, there are, there are three offering boxes located throughout the room that you can place your giving envelopes in. You can also go to give to moretolife.com where you can give safely and securely from any mobile device or tablet. Personally, my favorite way to give is through the More to Life Church app, which can be downloaded for any iPhone or Android device. And don't worry, it's safe and secure. Thank you so much for worshiping with us through giving. That wraps up our announcements for this week. If you missed anything, you can always check out our Facebook page or by visiting our websites, m2lministries.com. Don't forget to connect with us on the M2L app right from your phone. It's a pretty awesome way to receive notifications and to sign up for any upcoming events. We love you all, and we hope you encounter the Lord's presence today here at More to Life. I think you're waiting on me. I was over there writing something. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, it, what a great crowd for the end of July. I mean, really, the, the, literally. It, usually July is a sparse time, but it really wasn't um, for the most part this last month. And I thank all of you for joining us in worship today. I do have a, a, a couple of announcements. The first one's a really great one. Um, I don't know if this, I lose count, I don't know if this brings us to six new babies or five or six in just in the last couple of months, but this last week, Chris and Brooke, Noel had little Zoe Lee, seven pounds, 11 ounces, grandparents are here today, so they're pretty excited, so the little girl, so thankful for a healthy birth and adding to the nursery, and speaking of the nursery, and I, normally we have up on the stage um, right now during this time of year we have two and three year olds in the mommy room but we never know what we're facing when we come in this morning that when we got here um, the custodians had started working on the stage and had sanded that area so we can't use that area today so we have to punt and and it's always good to punt you know sometimes you just got back and punt and we put all our kids together so all of them uh, are back behind this wall so if you normally see have your kids going to two and three year olds or right back here uh, today just for today 
and we'll pick back up in the normal place next week. Um, yesterday we had two events happen that were, were big events, and, and some of you helped um, with each one. We had a cleanup that we did corporately with other churches in Douglas Brown, and that was a very successful venture. Had a lot of people come out. Uh, they were able to, to clean up a lot and feed a lot of folks, and it was just a good outreach time. We also had a, a work day at the property in which we got a, a lot. We got some fence built back. We had some silt fence put up, some mowing and weed eating, a lot of things that have needed to get done as we start moving there again. So it, it was a great day all around. Thank you to all of you who came out and helped, and some of you are watching online today, but thank you for coming out and help. It, it was a really, really very successful. Um, two more things. Our youth are on their way back. Uh, they, they had a great week at camp. They should be headed back this morning. I got word this morning just before I, I stepped up that, that last night uh, three campers from here gave their life to Christ. So we have three, three young people that, that got saved, gave their life to Christ for the first time. Two of them they baptized then. So really, really exciting. I can't wait to hear the story. So, but we'll pray for them later just in their trip coming back just for safety. Um, last thing, this is, a, this is an unusual week. We normally, when we, when we break down, we always take the tables and, and load them up back onto the truck and put the chairs up. We'll still have to put the chairs up where they go, but our tables are not going to go on the truck this week. The, the school is borrowing them for a, or a teacher orientation. So what we'll do is at the end of the day when we roll our tables, we're just going to roll them over by the, by the double doors and we'll prop them up against the wall right there. So they'll just, they'll just be stacked there. You don't have to take them outside. And for our guys that normally help to load them on the truck, first of all, thank you to all of you that do that each and every week, but you get the week off. How about that? It's really good, really good. Stand with me if you would. If you bow your heads. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. And we, we get the chance to worship today. And Lord, even as the, the world seemingly in, in utter chaos around us, we want to push into your presence. Lord, I, I pray that that would drive your church to our knees. And so we come today to worship you. We come today to sing, to pray to study your word, to cry out together. We do that corporately, Lord, and we do that, Lord, through those online that are watching at home right now. I pray for them, Lord. Some, some are well, some are, are not well, and, and Lord, I just, and for all of our folks that are missing and for all that are joining us, Lord, I pray that today, right now, they would push into your presence as well with us here. As we worship corporately, as we lift up your name, as we bring an offering of praise, and lay it at your feet, Lord. May that offering be pleasing to you because our hearts, Lord, are clean and right before you. So we humble ourselves, Father. We ask you to cleanse us, Lord. We ask you to wash us. We humble ourselves, Father. And we worship you now as we sing. In your mighty name we pray, Lord Jesus. I say it all the time. Let's do this again. God's good, right? What about his name? It's amazing, right? And the son, all powerful. When we think about it, and we're going to sing this song, and it says, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. And Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus. Can we say the name of Jesus real quick with me? Jesus. Amen. All powerful Jesus. Let's say it again. Jesus. Let's sing this song this morning. And as we do, let's remember the power in his name as we call out this morning. Let's remember the promises that he's made to us as we call out in his name this morning. All powerful, Jesus, we thank you.
bones to live Call these lungs to sing once again Oh, I will praise Jesus, Jesus Lay 
could not find in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my lord could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame amen the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope hallelujah and hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Again, let's sing it. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. Let's lift his name, Jesus. Repeat after me, Jesus, 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 we love you. Then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe amen out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on let's sing that again amen the morning that sealed the promise
his name again. Jesus. Jesus. When we're in times where we have nowhere to turn, what do we say? Jesus. When we're backed into a corner and we have nowhere to go, what do we say? In this time, when the world seems like everything's falling down around us, what do we say? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, silence fear. Jesus. You see? 
sing Jesus, you silence fear. You are speaking the truth. Pass those baskets on your table after, uh, right after prayer, so you can prepare those. There is, if we're still looking for a place to sit, there's two blank tables. There's an empty table here, empty table here. So we have two empty. Um, if you need a place to sit, you're welcome to join us there. We get the opportunity to pray together, though. We get that chance. We're crying out the name of Jesus. Hold that name. Hold that name. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2. He, he told us to have this attitude. He said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. That was the mind of a servant. He said, I want you to have that mind. I want you to have that attitude that you, that you would humble yourself. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He came in the likeness of man. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That was for us. He became obedient unto death for us. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and he's given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name. His name brings healing. His name brings life. His name brings salvation. His name is our living hope. He's all we have. Amen? He's all we have. I'm going to call you to come and pray. I'm going to ask you to come and pray. And let's cry out his name together. If you make your way here, come on. Come on, let's, let's just make an altar together. You can bow your knee here. You can stand. You can sit. You can make an altar at your table. But let's push into his presence together and cry out his name together. Calling out to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. always enter his presence with thanksgiving just be thankful for the name of Jesus just be thankful be thankful this morning for births and for new births for those that got saved this week at camp for the many children he's added to our number in the last few months Just say thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord At the same time that there's victory, there's always loss going on in our church family and around us. And I want you to pray this morning for the Tyndall family. 
who lost Lamar this last week. Just, just lift them up in prayer. A grieving family. I want you to pray also for the entry family who lost a, a grandmother in that fire, but we're also going to go to the mat for a little girl. I believe her name is Trish. Patty and JR's little girl. Just cry out for healing for her. She needs a touch from Jesus. you're here this morning, whether you're at the altar here gathered around or whether you're still at a table, if you'd like for somebody to pray with you, if you just lift a hand, we'll come to you. We'd love to do that. We'd love to come alongside you and pray with you. We'll not overwhelm you. Anywhere. We can intercede alongside you with you. I know that a number of you are already praying with folks and I thank you for that. Thank you for that. see you. Thank you, sweetie. Anywhere else? Can I have a lady right here, please? Right here. Lift your hand again, sweetie. There you go. It's a privilege to cry out in prayer for family, for loved ones, for strangers that you don't know. God allows you to be an intercessor. He allows you to reach out and touch someone in prayer and reach up to touch heaven. Lord Jesus, as we pray for those families, Lord, as we pray for those in loss, in mourning and grief, I, they just need you, Lord. They just need you. Just surround them, Lord. We have many, Lord, that are still ill. You know every circumstance. We pray, Father, for healing in areas that need physical healing from you. We intercede and cry out for that sweet little girl, Lord, that needs a touch, a healing touch, complete healing touch, Lord, from you. Lord, I'm praying for spiritual healing and for spiritual revival in our midst today. Thank you for the salvations of those three young people, Lord. Lord, I pray for an awakening among the folks here. Whether watching online or whether here worshiping with us, I pray for an awakening, Lord, of the body of Christ. Lord. Revival, Lord, that's ushered in through confession and repentance. True revival, Lord, that lasts. You're our only hope, Lord. You're our only hope. said, Lord, we bow our knee to you and to you alone. And we cry out to you and to you alone. Thank you for meeting with us here today. Thank you for filling this place with your spirit. Lord, as Pastor James comes to bring word, to speak powerfully through him, Lord. Words of life, 
words of life. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord. And Lord, I, I pray that for every person that came in the room today, that, Lord, they would connect with you, that they would receive a touch from you as they push into you, Lord, as they press in, Father, just to touch you, Lord, that they would recognize that they've been with Jesus today. We bless your name. In your mighty name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to remind you to pass those offering baskets, if you will, to the outside walls. And if you would do that for us, I would appreciate that. We would. Once again, in the book of Mark, the first verse. Start, I mean, the first chapter starting in the ninth verse. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the net. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you, you do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him, and they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed with demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Lord, now we do ask that you would honor and bless the reading of your word. And in the next few moments, just speak to our lives. Speak deep. Reveal to us who you are. We've lost you in this world. My fear is that in many places we've lost you in the church. We sing that song today, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness flee. And let us be reminded that at the name of Jesus, 
all things are held in your hand. Go well beyond the words of this preacher. Speak into our lives. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have seen over the last few three weeks that Jesus came on the scene, and when he did, there was nothing like it. They had never seen anything like it. And he came on the scene revealing himself in reality, revealing himself as the Messiah who they had been waiting on now for 1,500 years or more. And as he comes on doing it, he will do these things and say these things that had they really paid attention, they would have seen it. But they were looking for something else, and they were looking in the wrong direction. We saw last week that he revealed his identity as the God-man, that he was the turning point of history. you got to think about it. For 33 years, God walked among us in flesh. Now, there were some who recognized it, but most of them did not. How do you miss that? I guess you miss it because you don't expect it. You're not looking for it. You just have your mind all going the other way and you miss what's right in front of you. He revealed his authenticity that he was tempted without sin. He revealed his authority to call men to repentance. He has that authority. He has that right. There are people, some people in my life, that just don't have that right to confront me with stuff. You've not earned it. But he earned it because he created this world. He created you. He has everything to do with you. He can call you to repentance. And not only can He call you to repentance, He can call you like He did these men in their boats to follow Him. And it says immediately they got up. Now that had to be strange to everybody around Him. James and John actually left their father in the boat. I'm sure He appreciated that. They just got up and left Him. Now it was honored to be called by a rabbi, but you usually get a few weeks to go home and get things ready. Not this one. Come on, follow me now. Let's go. And they got up and left him. He said, follow me as Lord, and I'm going to make you become fishers of men. Do we realize how insignificant, how significant he is? We come in here on church on Sunday mornings and we say Jesus is Lord. We'll say it through the week. But do we realize what that means? We live in a day and age to call somebody Lord would be definitely uh, wrong. And our virtue signaling day and our day of political correctness, nobody gets to be called Lord. They have those over in England. They had those over in the old country. But no one is called Lord today. You've got presidents and CEOs and bosses and senators and presidents and all of that stuff. But He is Lord now I want that to sink into you as we begin to look at what we're going to look at today. That Jesus is Lord and He reveals His authority to speak for God. Now when He shows up in that synagogue, He is speaking for God and they've never seen anything like it. They said this is, this is completely different from all these other guys. He's completely different from the scribes and the teachers of the law because the teachers of the law just regurgitated something that somebody else said. They just recycled the opinions of other people. Rabbi Shammai says, Rabbi Hillel says, and they would argue about what was in the Torah and what so-and-so had said 400 years ago and whatever. But when Jesus spoke, He spoke directly from the overflow of who He was. The Son in unhindered, perfect relationship with the Father. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God in these last days has spoken this to His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He created the worlds. He is the brightness of His glory. He is the express image of His person. He upholds all things by the word of His power. When Jesus spoke, He spoke executively. I speak legislatively. I speak from the authority of Jesus. Jesus spoke from the authority of the Father. He spoke from His own authority as the God-man, as the Son of God. He was the one who spoke creation into place. Let there be light and there was night. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and not anything was made that was made. In Him was life, and that life is the light of men. After the fall, He spoke now and He speaks redemptively. And He is speaking to your life. 
But the problem of Him speaking into your life today, while He was on earth, they heard Him vocally. They heard Him. He was the Word of God in flesh, speaking as the very voice of God. Now that voice is still speaking. But He's not standing on a street corner. He's not walking into the church today. He's speaking to your heart from the inside out. And He's calling you to deal with your sin. He's calling you to come to Him and, and repentance and come to Him letting Him deal with your life. But the problem of the stuff that He speaks to is you don't want anybody to deal with it. I want to cover up my sin. I want to ignore my stuff. Jesus is constantly saying, I want you to know me. But to know me, I've got to get all of that stuff out of your life so that you can experience what I want. See, the problem, listen to me, folks, in the lives of Christians, it's not how much bad is in my life. It's how much good is in there for the Holy Spirit that I keep damning up because of the stuff I won't let go of. He's constantly saying, listen, if you will let go of this, if you will let me deal with this, I've got so much more for, me, for you, but you can't imagine life without it because it's become to identify. And one day, he will speak in judgment power. Now, in many places across this earth, he is speaking in judgment power. And in many ways, I think he is speaking in judgment of power to our nation. Are we at the end of our nation? Are we at the uh, purging? What? I don't know. I don't know. We have my years ahead of us. Do I think he's pruning the church? Yes. Do I think he's dealing with the stuff and the hidden stuff in our nation? Yes. Do I think that stuff that's been underground for years, he's pushing to the surface? Yes. And we need to understand there is a current in our nation that is so godless that is not just trying to tear down our nation. It's trying to destroy God from our minds. In the French Revolution, it is told that one peasant said to a priest, because they acquainted the church right there with all the oppression as is happening today. And some peasant said to the priest, we're going to tear down, we're going to tear down God, the name of God. And the priest said, then tear down the stars from the sky. There is no other name but Jesus. And Jesus speaks with the word of his power. And when He speaks in the Word of His power, He speaks directly to you from God. And God is speaking to your life today. He's calling you to come to Him. He's calling me to deal with your stuff. Carrie spoke from the word, that Word today. Now Carrie speaks only legislatively, but He still speaks for God. And God showed us the example of while, Jesus showed us the example, that while He was on earth, what it would be like for those of us, or you, who was supposed to speak for God every day, who were supposed to be fishers of men, who were supposed to go and make disciples. Now please listen, and I want you to write this down. We speak for God because we can speak from God. But that calls for a deep, vital overflowing relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want to say that again. We speak for God because we have the potential to speak from God. But that requires an overflow of a deep and vital relationship with the Holy Spirit. I hear a lot today about someone has the anointing. And it's almost like they were sitting quietly and suddenly it came on them like a shower and they couldn't help it. The anointing comes from overflow. An overflow comes from intensity. And that comes from intimacy. And that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that comes when I give my life completely over for me. That means the anointing of God is not something I possess. It's something I receive. And if I do not walk in intimacy and intensity and dealing with my stuff, that anointing can be taken away. But Jesus never lost that anointing. Remember, he was the God-man, tempted without sin. And he spoke with absolute fluidity from God. I want you to notice another thing. He reveals his authority over the unseen world. Could you imagine being there when he cast that demon out? Now, you and I have heard of people who cast out demons. But they had been 400 years without a prophet. Isn't it interesting that that demon could hide himself in the synagogue and nobody would have noticed him. And he probably was there for years. You know that demonic powers can hide themselves in churches? They can get themselves in leadership boards and leadership. They can get there and they begin to tear a, a, a church apart because all they want to do, they don't want to deny the name of Christ, they just want to turn you that far off and let you begin to walk down a thing that's all about you. 
And Jesus, they said, who is this and what is this that he commands even the evil spirits and they obey him? They had never seen that in a scribe. They had never seen that in a Pharisee. When Jesus said, they say that you cast out demons by Beelzebub, and they said, by who do your sons cast them out? Well, they weren't casting them out. They had no explanation for this. If Jesus was not who he said he was, who they didn't believe, if he wasn't the Son of God, then they said, well, he's in league with Satan. He said, no, 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 that's not the way this works. Well, who are these spirits that he is calling out? They were fallen angels who were bailed with Lucifer and then were banished from their original state. What was their original state? They were God-given power. They were created with God with a God-given power, a A power beyond what we understand, unless we're walking in the Holy Spirit, because we can cast them out. But they had a God-given power, a God-given thing to glorify and exalt the person and the purposes of God, and to minister those purposes, the will of God, both His mercy and His judgment in men. They were created to minister to us. I believe that's why they fell. Now, I don't have, there's nowhere in the Scripture that says this. This is my opinion. I believe the reason that Satan rebelled is because he did not want to have to serve me or you. Could you imagine having that kind of power and being told you were going to have to serve those ants down there? Could you imagine being have that kind of power and told you were going to have to minister to those you thought were absolutely inferior to you? Because we don't want to do that. We always want to be superior and keep it that way. But that's not what the angels were designed to do. They were designed to be ministers. You and I were designed to be servants. Stewards. Just like they were. And then they fell. And from that fall, everything changed. All the files were corrupted. Everything was twisted. Everything was perverted. People say, don't you believe there's conspiracies in the world? I believe there's one big conspiracy. And he fell from heaven. And since that time, for thousands of years, he's had two things on his mind. Number one, to oppose God. To oppose the person of God, the purposes of God, to do everything he can in your mind to tell you that God is not there, that God is this and that, and to lie against God and to oppress people. To oppose God and to oppress you. Do you feel like there's an oppression in your marriage? There is. Do you feel like there's an oppression at your work? There is. Do you feel like there's an oppression in this government? There's been one long before Donald Trump showed up. There was an oppression in this government long before Obama showed up. Long before Bush. Long before Nixon. There's been an oppression at work since the fall of man. And he constantly works. And every civilization that has ever come, it will rise to its zenith and then it will always degenerate because the second law of thermodynamics after the fall was this. That things go from order to chaos. Even the world, even the creation groans. Even our world itself, our very natural world, is being oppressed by the evil that is in this world. And he's trying to keep you in bondage somewhere. There's not one of us in this room, listen to me, that does not have some area that if you do not let God deal with it, will keep you in bondage. Oh, James, I don't have bondage in my life. I don't, I don't have any issues of alcohol or drugs. Yeah, but you've got a issue, big issue of unforgiveness. You have a big issue of not wanting to come under anybody's accountability. You have a big issue of wanting to be your own boss, to stay in control, and the enemy wants to let you say, Lewis, this is my life, no one gets to lead it. This is my body, no one gets to lead it. The fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ is the Lord of this world. He speaks in the word of His power. And the fact of the matter is, we are the only creation that can tell Him no. When the, enemy, when, this, when the angels rebelled, they were cast out of heaven. Now there will be a day when He will set all things right. But you and I have the potential to tell Him no. But let me tell you this, listen to me. There's an area in your life where you are telling Him no. It's not going to end well. Now slow down here and I want you to hear me. 
there's an area in your life that you know is against the very design, the very Word of God, and you've got all these reasons why it's okay, why all these reasons why the church is coming against you, why you're being judged. The fact of the matter is, when it comes one day to stand, you won't stand before more to life ministries. You won't stand before the Baptist church, the Pentecostal church. You will stand before He that spoke the world into creation. You will speak before He right now that is speaking in great grace, but there is a time when the day of grace will end and the day of judgment will. And every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of God. Yes, if things don't change in our country, if this thing that is happening in our country and we don't get a grip on it, it's going to bring a revolution and it's going to bring pain. And I don't know how much longer it has, but see, every country goes through this. If you go back through history, we're just going through the history that every country goes through. Can we write it? The Bible says, if God's people who are called by His name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, He will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin. He will heal our land. If. In the book of Joel, it says, who knows? If, call the sacred assembly. Next week, I'm going to be talking to you more about the whole issue of prayer and why it's so essential. But I want to say this to us today. The fact of the matter is, the healing of this nation depends on God's people. Silent. Because I don't believe we believe that. I think that you think the healing of this nation is making sure that you have at least six guns in your house full well with ammunition and stock for the day that you have to shoot the zombies. How long are you going to hold out? There are some today that are crying for a civil war. Let me tell you, if you take student from the last one, it won't end well. We are praying against an entrenched position. War will not end war. Hatred will not end hatred. Injustice will not bring justice. But if God's people, who are called by His name, do we really believe that? I think if we did, we'd pray. i got to tell you, about two weeks ago, I decided I was just going to quit watching Facebook. My stress level went way down. So yesterday, like an idiot, I decided to look again. All of a sudden, I'm all, oh, I got everything ready, I got everything prepared, I got it. And the Lord says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I make the darkness flee. Understand when the enemy fell, and you have to understand this, and please listen to me. Satan and his fallen angels are not the evil equivalent of God. There's no yin and yang. Satan is a, was a created being. He fell by his own pride and his own cleverness. And he came and he tempted Adam and Eve and they fell. And he usurped, usurped their authority over this earth. And now he rules oppressively over this world system by a hierarchy of fallen angels. But his power does not lie in his power. His power lies in his tongue. It lies in his deception. But he has nowhere near the word of power that our Lord does. One day he will come and he will just speak from his mouth and it will be done. He is a liar and a murderer. He is the father of lies. And as we yield to his influence, and this is what you are seeing going on in our streets, a younger generation who have been taught lies, that have been taught a system of government called Marxism that has never worked anywhere that always ends up in the destruction of the nation it comes into but they're being lied to by those who have been lied to by those who were lied to before them you're being lied to every day every moment 
And the more we give ourselves over to it, the more we give ourselves un- over to it, the more we come under His deception and it results in destruction. What's going to have to happen is for God's people to start screaming, Jesus! Jesus! You know, it won't be popular. But there is power in the name of Jesus. Now, I didn't ask him to sing that song today. That had to be a God thing. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the Word of Jesus. Jesus speaks in His Word of His power. And the evil spirits must obey. But He left that in our hands. And what are we doing with it? Two questions always come to my mind, and I've got to get going, but two questions come to my mind is, why did the evil spirits cry out? You'd think they wouldn't have said a word, wouldn't you? You see, because they, 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 they grow and they, and they get strong in secrecy and darkness. So why did they speak? I don't think they could help it. I think in their DNA, down at the core of their DNA, the way they were made, they were made to exalt and praise the name of Jesus. And when they came and encountered with Him, they could not stop themselves. Now we are in a creation that can hold our tongue, but there will be a day when we stand in His presence that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They were in a day of their own judgment and they could not stop themselves. Why did Jesus stop them? Because they already lost their opportunity. He says, no more. You lost that opportunity when you fail. I will not receive your witness. He wanted no one to say, well, I heard the witness of the demonic spirits. No, he said, look at me, watch me, listen to me, you be quiet. I know you know who I am, but you get no right to speak. Wouldn't that be an awful thing? And yet we have the right to speak and we don't do it. What happened to us? We've been cowed down with fear. And the man who's speaking to you is the worst culprit of it all. Why are we afraid? Because we've been conditioned to be afraid. And then he reveals his authority over sickness. That was a big one. He goes into Peter's house and his mother-in-law's sick and he just goes and heals her. Now we know it was a thing of God because he did it completely. She had a fever. She goes from being a fever, bedridden. It sounds the idea almost at death's door. He touches her. She's healed immediately, supernaturally, and she gets up from her deathbed and goes and starts serving them. That is the hand of God. That night, they bring everybody in the whole city to him. Not only the sick, but the demon possessed because they already knew earlier in the day he'd cast out demons. So this is a two-pronged threat. Not only has he cast out demons, but he heals sicknesses. Would you have gone? Yes. You see, I think one of the reasons that the church is not growing people today because they don't see that kind of power. When you look at the Gospels in the book of Acts, you see miracle and message. Message and miracle, they go together. But in our churches today, we don't see that. Large crowds came. Why? Because when Jesus speaks, when Jesus is present, all things are possible. Do you believe that? Do you believe that all things are possible? That He gets hope for new deliverance, for new life, that there is more to life? That there is healing for the whole man in Jesus, body, soul, and spirit? By His stripes, we are healed. That here is something beyond the realm of men, that this is God at work. Understand this. Now please listen. Sickness was an aberration to God's design. It was never supposed to be there. You and I were supposed to live forever. Adam and Eve screwed that up. You would have too, so don't be mad at them. If it had been James and Robin, we'd have done the same thing. Been carrying Fran. We'd have done the same thing. So don't be mad at them. There's not one of us who's going to make it out of here without Jesus. Isn't it great that the God of creation chose to be a God of redemption? That He didn't go right to judgment? Sickness and sin 
both sickness physically, mentally, emotionally, natural disasters and death, they came as a fall. Some years ago, I was preaching <clears throat> through a series. I was back at First Baptist then. <clears throat> and this girl on her way home from a sleepover was abducted at a, gas, at a, a walk, car wash, and they found her body three days later. And I remember saying, Lord, how do we have faith? What do we say to this? How can there be so much bad? And I just needed the Lord. I kept saying, Where, why is there so much evil? Where are you? And I remember that night because my, my tradition is, thing or ritual is Saturday night before I sit on the bed and I go through my message. And I remember saying, Lord, I need an answer to this because I've got to stand up tomorrow. And he says, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking, why is there so much evil? Do you understand without Jesus there would be no good? The question is not, why is there so much evil? When Adam and Eve sinned, they released death in this world and darkness and evil. The question is, is how can there be any good? Only through Jesus. There is a red cord of redemption that works its way all through the Old Testament and in our life. And there's only one way you get out of this world alive. Buddha was a great teacher, but he did not die for you for your sins. Whole uh, religions built on Muhammad or Confucius, but they did not die for your sins. They did not rise again. They are not speaking with the word of the power of creation and redemption. There is no other name given among men whereby you must be saved than Jesus Christ. So healing and casting out of demons was an essential part of his ministry. Everybody that was brought to Jesus in the New Testament, he healed. Everybody. There's no story where Jesus did not heal them. There's no story where they brought a demon-possessed person where G Jesus did not cast out the demon. Jesus reveals Himself Lord over all things in the Word of His power and the Gospels every one. So my question today is, does He always heal today? There would be some that say definitely yes. But I'm going to speak to you after 36 years of ministry and I could be wrong. I pray that I am. Apparently not can't tell you about the people I have prayed for over 30 some years that were not healed. The people I have dealt for in counseling that the demonic spirit left them for a while but kept coming back. I just don't think it's that predictable. I wish it was. I wish I could put my coin in the slot and out came my answer. I'm not saying the time of miracles has ended. I'm not saying the time of healing has ceased. We should be doing what Jesus did. We should be seeing more. I believe we should be seeing people healed. One of the prayers of the disciples was cast out the demons. Reach out your hand to heal. Do miraculous signs and wonders. James said the prayer of faith would save the sick. There is power over disease and we should be seeing it. But I think Jesus was revealing something prophetic. There will be a day when King Jesus sits on the throne of this world physically. And in that day, all things will change. But we are not there yet. Let it be known to you that this Jesus who was crucified is Lord in Christ. While He was among us, we only saw glimpses of His glory. But one day, one day, He shall be revealed. He will sit on the throne of David as King over all creation and every knee will bow. He has authority over all things. Now His kingdom is unseen. Then every eye will see Him. And they will look upon Him whom they have pierced. And He will say, I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I am with He that was dead and is now alive again, who was and who is and who is to come. Then I saw heaven open on a white horse. 
And he who sat upon it was called faithful and true. With righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and it's on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he shall rule over them with a rod of iron. He shall tread the red winepress of the fury of God Almighty. And on his name and on his thigh is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And there was a loud voice in heaven and it says the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of His Christ. There shall come forth a root, a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow forth from His roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And He shall not judge by the sight of His eyes or decide by the hearing of His ears. But with righteousness when He sits on the throne, He will judge the poor. We have a group of people that are trying to change all injustice. That only comes when Jesus comes. He will decide for equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike down the earth with the rod of His mouth and with His breath of His lips He shall slay the wicked. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, from the throne, crying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or crying, or sorrow. And there will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things. Then the heaven show, heaven's angel showed me the river, the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On every side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And there shall be no more sin and no more curse, but the throne of the God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall worship Him. They shall see His face, and His name will be on His foreheads, and there will be no more night there. And they have no need of lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. He who testifies of these things says, Behold, I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. When I was a little boy listening to preachers preach about the coming of God, it scared me to death the coming of Jesus. Please listen to me for the next couple of minutes. I want you to hear me. There will come a day when He will come again. And the day you had to receive Him will be over. There is a deadline known only by God Himself. I do not know when the rapture will come. I don't know. My personal belief is that the church will go through very much of the tribulation. I hope I'm wrong. My brother says we don't. I hope he's right. But there come a day when he will come in the clouds and he will no longer be the carpenter of Nazareth. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and I will stand before Him. 
We sit in a church service like this and we say, yeah, but not in my lifetime. I didn't think I'd ever see what we're seeing in the streets of America in my lifetime. Do you understand when a nation turns its back on God, God will purge it with evil rulers? With people in authority that have no heart for God and will turn its back on God? That's what we're seeing. If things continue to go the way they are unchecked, there'll be a day when a pastor will not be able to stand in the pulpit and tell you the things I've told you today. In the days of Adolf Hitler, the churches had to sign a compliance document. If not, the pastors were put in prison. In the churches was a copy of the Bible and a copy of Mein Kampf with a Nazi flag behind them. And they could not speak out or they went to prison for it. We are not there yet. I am not trying to scare you. I'm trying to help you understand that the only thing that turns a nation back from godliness is for God's people to cry out. The only thing that needs to happen for evil to prevail, Edmund Burke said many years ago, is for good people to do nothing. I don't think we need to take to the streets and scream out I think we need to take to our knees and cry out for Jesus Christ to once again speak in the word of His power. I am convinced of this, and I'll talk more about it next week. The book of Joel tells us, and the book of Jeremiah and the prophets say it is possible to turn back the judgment of God when there is true repentance. Pastors across this nation are going to have to start speaking like prophets. Do you know there are churches in America that have quit preaching from the Bible? Or they've turned it around to fit their political agenda? The Bible does say certain lifestyles are wrong. It doesn't say them because God hates them. It says it's because He designed life to work a certain way and that lifestyle you've gotten into destroys you. It's not because God hates us that He deals with us. It. It's because He loves us. He kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden because he loved them. Because he knew if he ate of the tree of life, they would be caught in that condition forever. It was God's grace. And that grace has been working in this world since the day Adam and Eve sinned. And it is working in your life. God's grace is shown upon this country and He has shown upon your life. And I want you to listen and I'm done. If you've got issues going on in your home and in your life that you're holding back from God, not only will, you not, will it keep from judgment happening on this nation, the purging will come to your home. And it will come to your life. As a nation, we have played games with God. The Jewish people in the time of Jesus thought they could cast Him away and He would just be gone. They thought they could put Him on a cross and it would be all over. But He always rises again. Russia thought they would stamp out God. But the Iron Curtain came down and Jesus Christ prevailed. And there will be nations across this world that will do it over and over again, but don't let it be you. My challenge to you today is Will you pray? Could you imagine being in that room when Jesus Christ healed that, mo that mother-in-law or cast out that demon? I'm convinced that God wants to visit the power of Jesus Christ on us again and miraculous power. I'm convinced He does want to see the, the, the sick healed and the demons cast out. I'm convinced He does want us to see it because in times of revival, there is always an increase of the work of God in miracles and power. But it will only come when you humble yourself before God. Week after week, we invite you to this altar. We do not do it because of a power trip.
We do not do it because it's the churchy thing to do. We do it because we believe there's power when people kneel their knee before a holy God. And I believe there is power when God's people together bow the knee before God and cry out for deliverance. Years ago, there was a book, a silly little book called written, Horton Hears the Who. Do you remember it? But deliverance did not come until every last one of them cried out. God is looking for every last one of His people to cry out. If you're not aware, then get aware. If you're too busy, then disentangle. We have a time where there's still hope. But if God's church does nothing but watch YouTube videos and Facebook and talk about the latest conspiracy theories, we will go down with it. Are we going to stand with the king of this universe? Then you stand on your knees. So with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to invite you to this altar. And I'm going to ask you to bow the knee and ask God to work. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I will never stop asking you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. We have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. And then so much of our praying is done so that we consume it upon ourselves. And Jolie said, call for the sacred assembly. Let the bride leave the chamber and the bridegroom leave it. Let the nursing mother and the child leave no one out. Do we really believe it? Then we'd be on our knees and trembling. We would be. Just begin to play something, guys, and let's take the time to be before Him. Will you cry out? Will you cry out for yourself? Will you cry out for this country? Will you cry out for the churches of America to rise up and pastors to preach as prophets? to preach with authority, to call God's people to repentance, to call God's people in their homes to make things right so they can pray in unity. Of course, we're three or more gathered together. There's power. The enemy started long ago destroying our nation by destroying our homes. Cry out. Cry out for deliverance cry out. Because there will be no peace until the King of Peace brings it. Father, we love you. I have no words to say other than Bring your power. Bring your power to humble us and break us before you. And teach us to pray. Teach us to pray for deliverance. And use the prayers of your people to turn the nation back to God. Would you guys sing that song, Jesus, Jesus, in closing? Let us stand and make this a prayer. Let's sing it with them. He makes the darkness tremble.
for meeting with us today, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to worship, to cry out, Lord, bring your power. Lord, I'm praying for repentance among your people. Pray, Lord, that we bow our knee here on this side of heaven. We bless your name, Lord worship you and as we go out the door today we go out Lord as your people able bodied ministers that you called to do your will Lord I know that if we love you that we'll keep your commandments so Lord I'm, I'm praying for obedience and that obedience begins with repentance thank you Father in your mighty name we pray Lord Jesus Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining us online. We love you. Remember, we'll put the table.